Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the second part of this day. I would, like, I would like to introduce to you Georg Schönberger, who will give us a talk about Linux performance profiling and monitoring. Thanks for the introduction and um, another time. Hello, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the lunch. And I hope also that you're not too tired now to follow my talk about Linux performance profiling and monitoring. We have quite a tough um, program the next hour, and I hope I will not um, overrun too much. But uh, <laughs> if, it is, if it is too boring, just raise your hand and say, OK, next slide. Um, so um, I am working for the Thomas Krenagy, a server manufacturer in Bavaria. Who knows us? So who knows the Thomas Krenagy? Yes, nice. So who has servers from us? Yes, nice too, OK. Raise your hands up, up. <laughs> um, we also have a well-known um, knowledge base, our Thomas Grenwicki. So who knows the Thomas Grenwicki? Maybe more people know that. Oh, thanks a lot. Please give us any feedback if you have um, just about uh, comments to improve our articles. We are always um, open for feedback. Um, this is the program for the next hour. We start with collecting some statistics about our Linux system. These are, in general, uh, basic tools. Everybody knows a lot of a lot of stats tools. Then we watch some online statistics with the, the top base tools. So we watch the we watch live um, resource usage. Then we do some tracing with performance and F trace, and also explain what flame graphs are. Um, we then, if we have time, we go um, further to lag C containers, and if there's time, at the end we will cover some MySQL topics. So, okay, let's start right now. We have to hurry up. So the first thing are statistics. I think everybody has um, used a lot of these tools mentioned on this picture. This picture is from Brandon Gregg, um, um, famous um, performance guy. So Brandon Gregg uh, uses a lot of, of DSTAT, which is um, from Solaris and BSD systems. Um, we will focus on the tools highlighted here in this orange um, circles. So S-Trace, I've just kicked out of the slides because I do not have um, time to cover that, uh, but I think everybody knows S-Trace, so this is a, a basic tool. We will cover the, all the stat tools, IOSTAT, NETSTAT, and PITSTAT, and DSTAT, so all the things highlighted here, and also that the top live usage tools. Um, this is not the number of minutes I'm going to overrun this talk. This is the number of tools I mentioned in my talk, and. I put this slide um, every, um, two, uh, every five or six slides just to know how much tools we have covered yet. So take a deep breath if you see this slide, then we do some, some, we do some pause and we take a deep breath and just to, to relax and, and cover the next tools. Um, the first thing I want to, to mention is MPStat. This is a, a good tool to get an overview how well balanced are your algorithms in your system. So you get an overview of all the usage um, of the CPU cores your, your system has, and not only the, the real um, physical CPU cores, but also the hyperthreads your system is using. So if you have two cores and two hyperthreads per socket, then you see four cores with MPSTAT. So if you, if you have a lot of cores, then MPSTAT output will, will get long there. Um, yes, this is a first overview. We can see most of the cores are idle here, so there's nothing going on in my system. There is some um, resource usage on our system on core one. As you can see, the, um, the, the usage is not very balanced in the system because um, three cores are idle, core zero, core two, and core three are idle, but there's some, yeah, some performance test running on core zero. This is, was basically a FIO performance test doing some I.O. And as we can see, we have some I.O. weight here. The CPU is idling because it is waiting for um, uh, I.O. being done on the, on the disk drives. We will cover that later on when, when um, coming to IOSTAT, what this number means for us. We have also the sys and the user um, resource widgets. Um, user says, OK, how much time uh, CPU time is spent in user code and how much time is spent in system code. This is the percent sys column. OK, we have 23% um, in running a kernel code and 11% running in user application code. 
We Amstat is also a, a tool which, which gives some high-level statistics about uh, virtual memory usage. Um, so you get a lot of counters, a lot of summary counters about the currently used uh, memory usage. We have the um, uh, swapped usage in kilobytes. We have the um, amount of free memory. We have the amount of used buffers in cache. So this is a good summary, and this is also um, a good tool to um, to collect um, historical data so you can see how well your system is using memory usage and you also have to collect to, to get an overview of how your system is using memory. We also have blocks in and block out statistics, so how my system is using the, the block devices underneath. There is again a few tests running here, so blocks out are, is a write test and blocks in is a read test. Um, in the system column, we, you also get information about um, interrupts and context switches. This is um, mainly interesting for algorithms running on your CPU. And at the end, we have um, some CPU timers, um, wait times and steal times. The memory statistics, they correlate with the output from the well-known free program. So everyone has called free sometimes on this system to see how much memory is free, how much memory is available. Um, okay, the first time you think, okay, that's not very much memory free on my system, but you have to consider that a lot of memory is buffered and cached. Um, buffer, uh, buffer cache are raw disk blocks like file system metadata that is used by the kernel, and the cache are, is memory used for real data information, so pages with actually user contents in it. And if you subtract that from the free memory, then we have nearly four gigabytes of free RAM, but a lot of um, memory is used for caching actual user data, so that's good to know. You also have process-related fields in VMstat. These are the first two columns, column B and column R. So R is the number of runnable processes currently running or waiting for runtime. If this is high, then you have an indicator for CPU saturation. So if there is a high number of processes currently waiting for CPU time, then maybe you have to, to put some more cores in your system. And B is the number uh, of processes in uninterruptible sleep, and this is mostly if the processes are waiting for I.O. So if you, ha if you have a high number of processes waiting in uninterruptible sleep, then maybe your um, block device is oversaturated. You can check with the ps command um, in which kernel function your processes are currently sleeping. So this is a, a nice tool with ps, so everybody knows ps. But what I like a lot is that you can customize the columns you used. You have the wgen um, parameter here, and you can grab for the x4 columns, and then you get, okay, my processes are doing some file writes. So there are some file writes going on in the system, and this, um, this um, processes are, are in an uninterruptible state waiting for the X4 file writes. You can see that in the, in the process states from the PS output. So if you have any questions, just raise your hand and ask directly because afterwards it's hard to remember what was on slide XY. Um, you can also generate some plots from VMstat. I really like plots a lot. Um, everybody knows GNU plot. Sometimes it is hard to use. So there are a lot of automatic scripts out there that generate um, plots from the tools. And if you want to use VMstat plotter, then you can just call VMstat and from a um, VMstat um, texture file that you, you captured, and then you can generate some plot. This is again um, a plot from a few. Um, performance test, first doing some write testing and afterwards doing some random read test. And I've drawn here interrupts and context switches. Obviously, most of the time we are not satisfied with summaries and overviews. So we really want to know what is PIT um, 1959 doing? Okay, so what program can you use to to know to get um, more information about your process IDs? Any ideas? S trace. Okay, yes, you can trace a, a currently running PIT. That's true. PIT stat. Okay, that's the correct answer. <laughs> yeah, so plus. Um, so PIT stat reports statistics for the task currently managed by the kernel. Um, you have um, two reports available. If your task is CPU-bound, then you can identify the peak activity with the CPU report. 
you can first, oh, sorry, that was the wrong button. You can first um, call top in batch mode and sort by the CPU column. And you can check, okay, there is some Python script running and it is using 96% of my CPU and it's consuming some memory. But you want to know more about that Python script, then you can call pit start with the process ID you get, you've got with um, top. Then you can check um, the utilization report and we will call that one time. And then you can see, okay, there's a, multi, a matrix multiplication running in Python there, um, all done in user application code. So if you have 100% user resource utilization and no kernel code invo uh, involved, and it is using 100% of CPU. And you can even check the command line arguments from this Python script running there. So pitstart is really a nice tool because if your um, PIT is doing some I.O. bound, um, some O pound, um, some O pound workload, then you can also generate a device report. And you first um, check with MPSTAT, okay, there's something running um, on my CPU on core one. This is the same slide as we have seen before at the MPSTAT slide. But you want to know, okay, which process is actually calling, um, causing I.O. weight on my system? You check the device uh, report with Pitstat, then you can see, okay, there's a random write test running with feel, and um, you can also check the kilobyte written to the device. So this is nice about Pitstat, these two reports. And Pitstat is also uh, reveals the command and the I.O. currently running on your system. We've heard about VMstat before, which is a summary tool, and we also want to get to know about the currently running task on the system, how much memory is a specific PIT consuming. And you can do that with PIT uh, too. You call the, um, you call the device specific report for a given PIT. And you can check, okay, this PIT is using this amount, um, this percent of memory now, and it's also generating some minor or major page faults. Um, major page faults require I.O. operation, minor page faults not. And if you have a lot of major page faults, then it's a good indicator that you need some more memory in your system. And okay, so this is the same column as you get with the top there, you also have a percent um, memory column. IOSTAT is a tool I liked a lot. I've also written um, a short article about IOSTAT in the formerly known um, admin magazine. Um, you get I.O. subsystem statistics with IOSTAT, and you have a CPU or a device utilization report. Um, without any argument, when you call IOSTAT, you get the summary counter since boot, but you can, skip, you can skip that with the Y option. So just, um, just running IOSTAT gives you the, the numbers since boot. Okay, that's not very, very much running on this system. Um, okay, so... I want to do this. I want to show this um, now live to you with the OSTAT. Um, I'm just at the top left um, terminal. I'm starting a random write test, just uh, producing some load. Okay, they are now running four threads. I'm just doing this. I'm, I'm calling a OSTAT here. And we see, okay, I'm just stopping this here. We have now produced some O weight. With, um, with feel, see, 40% of I owe it. You have to keep in mind that this is a summary of all your processors have. So we have seen before that with MPSTAT, we have four processors. So this is the I owe it, uh, um, the average of I owe it over all processors we've got in the system. Um, I'm starting the test again. And I'm calling MPSTAT now. And we can see that our workload it's actually running only. Um, okay, that's a. It's actually running only on core on core zero. So we have on core one. Sorry, and the other processor cores are idle. So with MPSTAT, you can check. Okay, actually the workload is only running on one CPU. With the OSTAT, you don't get this information because you have the average of all CPUs. So that is when we use MPSTAT for. And what I want to say is that you can't always rely on um, I/O wait time because I owe wait time is a subsec uh, subsection of CPU idle time. So I'm gonna show this to you. Again, we start the random read, uh, random write test. I'm calling OSTAT here. But 
if I start at the same time a CPU bound test on the same core, I'm doing this with task set. This is running now. Then we can see that, oh, sorry. That our IO wait time goes down to zero. So we have a IO bound workload running on CPU core one, and we have a CPU bound workload running on the same core. Then our CPU don't produces any idle time because the two tasks are running on the same core. So you can't always rely on IO wait time because it is a subsection of CPU idle time. That's important to keep in mind. Because most of the users just um, take a look at the OWID, okay, there is no OWID, then I don't have a problem with my, with my block devices, but that not, that's not true in, in every case. This is what I've basically highlighted on this slide. So I OWID, but if I run the CPU bound task on the same core, then I OWID goes down to zero. This is important to, to keep in mind. Um, the next thing I want to notice is the percent of utilization a device reports with a OSTAT. Um, if you read the man page, which we should do in, <laughs> for the tool if we use the tool, um, then it says, okay, for devices serving requests in parallel, such as RAID arrays or SSDs, this number does not reflect the performance limits. Um, does anyone know what utilization reports from a OSTAT? Can anyone explain that? Nobody? Um, it is basically, basically the time the CPU spends while waiting on requests being served on the device. So if we issue one request to the device, the CPU is waiting, okay, the device um, is now being served and, and gets uh, event back from the device driver. But um, if we issue five requests and the device can do that in parallel, then it gets information back, okay, the, the requests are being done but the, the CPU has spent the same time while um, issuing just one request. So if our device can, can serve more requests in parallel, then utilization is not a good indicator, it's not a good performance indicator. Um, of doing a, a short um, calculation here, in theory, when my device, um, can, when my device reports 44% um, percent utilization while um, reporting uh, over 30,000 IOPS, then in theory, if I just um, calculate this, just a simple calculation, it will serve 24,000 IAPs with 99%. But if you do the actual performance test, then you will see that you can double the IAPs to over 40,000 IAPs, but you get 99% utilization. So with SSDs and RAID devices, you cannot rely on the utilization column of IOSTAT. This is the second thing um, you really have to keep in mind with IOSTAT. So for for devices serving uh, requests in parallel, this utilization column is not a good uh, indicator. I've told you now that what are not good indicators for performance with OSTAT, now I want to, you to show what are good indicators. Um, we have to consider that OSTAT reports um, numbers from the block layer. So there's the block layer, this is our um, Linux storage stack diagram. Who knows this diagram? Who has already taken a look at it? One person, okay, nice. We also have some posters if you want that um, at our booth. Um, just, just grab one and be happy with our storage deck diagram. Um, so we want to take a closer look at the statistics given from, uh, for the block layer from OSTAT. And the first one is the average request size. And this is the average queue, queue length the O scheduler issues to the dispatch um, queue from the driver. So if we can, um, dispatch more requests to the device driver in the same time, then our um, block device is performing better because we can um, serve more requests. But you have to, to keep in mind that you have to look at this both indicators. So you have to take a look at the average queue length and you also have to take a look at the average time the requests um, needs being served. If you can serve more requests, but also um, the average waiting time increases a lot, then you don't have a better device because um, both are increasing. But if the average queue sizes increases and the waiting time stays the same, then your device can serve more requests in the same time. So these two numbers um, together are a good indicator for um, good performance of your block device. 
I've just summed this up in this sentence here. Serving more requests while the waiting time is not increasing is a good performance indicator. So these two numbers are from the extended um, device utilization report of IOSTAT. Just take a look at the time. So we have done four of um, near 25 um, command line tools. And just take a breath. It will not get that detailed um, now on the next few slides. Um, the first, uh, the next tool I want to present to you is um, the dstat uh, command line tool. And this um, copines um, several classic tools like uh, vmstat or mpstat. And the nice thing is that it uses colors, so everybody loves colors. And it also has a plugin concept. You can call plugins. You can read about the plugins in the man page. And for example, you can call the top memory plugin. Then you get the, the process IDs um, using, the, using the most memory in your system. This is um, dstat, just a short slide about um, dstat. If you are interested in network bandwidth, you can use Nixdat. Nixdat is, as far as I know, also written by Brandon Craig. And good indicators for your um, network bandwidth are um, the saturation column, the utilization column, and the drops. So if you, had a lot of, if you have a lot of drops um, concerning the TCP report from Nixdat, then maybe your um, network card is oversaturated and it has to drop some packets then you should um, take a look at your network speed. And um, saturation and util are always depending on the speed and the duplex mode of your network card. And the good thing about saturation is that it also takes drops and errors into account. So if you have a lot of errors and drops, um, then maybe your network card is oversaturated. Just a short question, who has um, some chronicle? about his system data, who is collecting system data every day? One person. Okay, I think uh, who is losing graphite? Who is using that? Okay, I'm not very familiar with graphite, but um, I've heard a lot of good things about it. Um, I'm just uh, mentioning here a simple, a simple um, implementation on how to collect some statistics about the system. If you just want a quick hack to collect some statistics, then you can use the system archive reporter. And this is an easy way to, to get some chronicle data from your system. Just install that and be sure to activate the data collector and the SA1 and SA2 cron jobs. And then you can basically collect all the things um, the system archive report covers. This is another nice um, picture done by Brandon, and it's an overview about what you can get with the system archive reporter. Um, who knows Casa, who has used it and who hates it? Okay, <laughs> it's Java-based, it's uh, unfortunately it's Java-based, um, but it's a simple way to, to check what's going on in the system. Um, if you have problems with uh, character encoding and number formats, then you can use the LCR um, environment uh, variable to ensure that you have the POSIX format in your numbers and your um, date formats in the CASA output. This is just, and then you can open this file, the, the output file you can open with CASA. This is a, a, a quick way to, to inspect the numbers collected by the system archive reporter. I've mentioned the Brock files in system here that um, to, to make clear that the Brock file system knows everything. All the tools we have um, looked now, all we have looked now um, are using, are collecting the numbers from the Brock file system. So if you're not sure about if your tools are correct, then you have to, to look at the Brock uh, file system directly. And I did not know that there's a Brock info command. Who, do, who did, uh, who knows that command, the Brock info? No one? Okay, it is a, a command line tool to, to output the, the content of the Brock file system in a formatted way. So that's, that's a nice tool. I did not know that. Just found it um, while preparing for the talk. So the Brock file system knows everything. In the next section, we will um, watch some tools online, so we will do some live watching at the tools. Well, top, 
knows, uh, everybody knows top and everybody's using top and then saying, okay, um, you get pair process metrics um, for top. You can also check the one, five and 15 minute load average with top and per default, the top output is um, sorted by the CPU usage. Okay, there's some intrusion detection system running OSSEC and it is consuming some CPU time and also top itself is consuming some resources. Um, you also have information about memory usage. And the first column you get with top is uh, Word, and Word is the total size of the virtual memory for the process available. And this number is also including not already um, mapped um, heaps, uh, for example, not already mapped um, heap memory or also swapped out memory. So this is, um, in most cases, um, a lot higher than the real physical memory usage of the process. Um, the resident memory is um, how many blocks are allocated and mapped to the address space. So this is the resident, me resident memory, but this memory also includes the shared memory. And we know that processes who share the same libraries also can share the same memory. So the M-mapped um, memory can be used by multiple processes in parallel. And the real memory used by the process is somehow between um, resident minus shared memory and resident itself. And this is called uh, anonymous memory, the actual memory the, the process really uses. So normally this is um, called, uh, this is um, increased by malloc. So if you call malloc, then the resident memory in increases. You can also get that by checking the statm file in the Brock file system. As we've learned before, the stack file, uh, the Brock file system knows everything. These are the three counters for uh, virtual, resident and shared, but not in kilobyte, but in pages. So this is the number of pages. These are normally a pages for kilobyte. What do we have to consider when we use top? Top can consume resources on its own. You have seen that in the output of top before, but you can also customize the view with top. You can um, add new fields. You can only check the processes running under a specific users. You can kill a process and you can also re-nice um, a process ID. Um, you also have to consider that top can miss short living processes because it is refreshing its output just uh, I think every second. And the next question is you have high CPU usage on your system, but what to do now? Okay, so 100% of CPU usage is not um, enough for us. We will cover that in the tracing part um, afterwards. Um, HTOP is a super advanced, amazing top, again, using colors. So who loves colors um, can use um, HTOP. And you can also um, do some interacting with the processes by using your, um, by using your F buttons, like sorting or re or even killing, like you can do it with the normal top. But you also have some graphical output there for how CPU usage is um, going on on your system now. Again, doing some block layer statistics. Um, who has already used IOTOP? Okay, most of you. Again, we are taking a look at some random, uh, at some random write testing. The command running here is doing some random write testing and issuing some writes to our block device and we can check that in real time, so that's nice about the OTOP. If you just, um, just want to know what's going on with your block devices, then you call IOTOP. Um, the first, uh, it's, it's the first um, tool you, you call when you want to know something about your block devices, so that's really nice IOTOP. Again, with bandwidth live usage, you can use um, IFTOP or Nethox. So IFTOP, you have, get statistics per interface, and with Nethox, you get them um, per process. Oh, there's a typo in it, sorry about that. So the process, there's some Firefox running here and some SHH connection. And with Nethox, you get that um, per process and not per interface. Sometimes you want to know which process is doing IO on my network and not how much is done. So that's nice with Nethox. Okay, nearly half time now. We have covered more than 13 tools now. Um, Yes, these tools are, are known by the most, um, most of our system administrators. This is, um, or, or who has um, already known all the tools I've presented now? 
I hope there's something new for you. Okay, there's one. Nice. <laughs> Sorry about that. I hope, no, I hope you're not too bored too much. Um, so maybe I can present you something new with the tracing part now. Um, so tracing our profiles about usage characteristics in the system. You count specific samples and events, and you count objects. And then you collect statistics, and you make statistics about these objects. And the next um, slides will focus on system profiling with f trace and perf events. And we will also get from time to time to, to the term trace points. And trace points are lines of kerneling code with a defined event. Um, F-Trace has been part in the Linux kernel since um, 2.6.27, since 2008. And you can check with F-Trace what is going on inside the kernel. And the common task is, is to, to trace events and to see what my process is doing um, in the kernel. And with F-Trace configured already in the kernel, the only thing you need is the debug file system, and then you can use um, F-Trace. So most users complain, okay, there is no simple example on how to use F-Trace, but I can show you that it's no, no magic behind. So I'm sorry. So this is a, a short um, best script you can use um, to, to trace your um, application, to trace a, a, a single command. So at the first, you... Um, you specify the process ID you want to use for tracing by, by um, echoing the process ID to set ftrace pit. In the next step, you state, okay, I want to use the function tracer, so I want to, to trace the function the kernel is using for the process ID. This is done by echoing function to the current tracer file. Then you turn um, tracing on, then you execute the command with the exec, um, with the exec statement, and then you turn tracing off. So I'm just calling this now, okay. Um, I'm using the date command here. And then we can, sorry. Oops. Head. So this has a lot of lines in it, this file. This is the, the trace file. The trace file now contains the trace about the command we have traced now. And this is the ftrace output, and these are a lot of lines. We can um, we will learn some um, graphical improvement on how to interpret these lots of samples by using flame graphs afterwards. So if you want to know just, okay, what um, syscalls and what kernel functions is my process using, you can achieve that with ftrace. And these are just uh, four, uh, five lines of bash. There's also an easier command line interface to all, the uh, to all the files in the debug file system. And this command line interface is called traced command. Who has already used traced command? Small person, okay, nice. And then you don't have to fiddle around with the, the files in the debug file system, but just call trace command, then you can start the trace command, you can filter for functions and so on. Um, the perf events and the perf tools um, they are formerly known as performance counters for Linux, and they also get a lot of uh, updates in the kernel version um, 4.1. And with the perf events, you can count CPU performance counters, but you can also collect um, statistics about static trace points, um, K probes, and U probes. And the perf events and the perf tools are included um, in the Linux tools common package. Um, this is true for Ubuntu. I don't know if this is the same for Debian or, but at least uh, in Ubuntu you can just install the tools common package, then you have all the perf um, commands available. Perf list is the first command we will look at. I've highlighted the hardware events here. We can see, okay, we can check how many CPU cycles or how many instructions my application is using. So if I call a command, then I can record with the perf tools how many instructions my application is doing. And this is not only limited to hardware events, but it also includes static trace points, like we have learned that before with ftrace. 
and there are nearly 2,000 events uh, available if you call perflist. At least this is for a uh, current um, kernel in Ubuntu. I don't know if that's the same for older kernels. So there are a lot of hardware events you can collect and you can sample with the perf command line tools. If you are not satisfied with the um, predefined um, hardware events by uh, the perf tools, you can dive deeper into the hardware counters your CPU provides. You just have to check the manufacturer documentation for your um, specific CPU. That's um, at least um, true for Intel. It documents the raw hardware counters. I don't know if that's also true for other hardware vendors. And then you can um, use so-called um, raw CPU masks um, you can use with the perf commands. Um, and there's also a nice way to find the raw counters with the libpfm um, library. You can see that if you grab for the raw um, CPU mask, then perflist allows some um, raw um, counters, and you can get that with the, with the library I've just mentioned here. You can say, okay, I'm calling show event info, and I want to know something about my last level cache misses my application produces. Then you can grab for the last level cache misses and then you can use that um, mask for the check events by libf, uh, libpfm4, and then you get the raw CPU mask, and you can use that CPU um, counter, that um, raw mask um, in conjunction with the perf start command, and then you can um, check the raw CPU counters. But you have to, to keep in mind that um, these masks are different for every CPU architecture and you have to check the, the documentation for your specific CPU. And what we've got here that we can now collect um, the last level cache misses for our application with this raw mask. I've mentioned before that perf also has trace functionalities. We can um, grab here for the, the trace events defined by the perf tools. Um, you can check um, trace points in the file system, you can check trace points in the block layer, and you can also record the number of syscalls your, your, um, your, pro, uh, your process or your, your program is doing. I've done that for a simple hello world command here, um, written in, in C, and you can say, okay, just printing out hello world using, um, is using eight syscalls. So that's that's a simple way with, with perf, um, you can check, okay, how many syscalls is my application actually doing? And that's not only limited to syscalls, but as I've stated here also, that's true for the file system or for the block layer or whatever, you can check that nearly 2,000 um, events. Um, I've collected a summary of the, of the events done for a matrix multiplication written in Python here. And that's an easy way to compare multiple algorithms, how well they perform on your CPU. So you can collect uh, an overview of statistics for your program with the perf stat command. And you can see, okay, how many context, context switches, how many instructions, how many branch misses are, are there on my, on my CPU for a specific algorithm. And if you have another algorithm, you think that performs better, then you can compare these values by collecting the, the perf stat events. Okay, uh, a good indicator is also the instructions per cycle. So if, more, if you have more instructions per cycle, then your algorithm is performing better on, on the CPU. With perf record, you can not only print um, the, the perf events out to, to standard um, out, but you can also record these samples to a file, which then can be post-processed with perf report. And then you can filter for events, you can filter for um, specific functions. And what is nice about perf record is that you, that you can also can record um, so-called um, call graphs, which is a history or a, a call stack from uh, about your, your function you're using in your program. A nice way to record um, all events that are currently running on your system is to use perf record in, um, in conjunction with the, the minus a switch, which says, okay, I want to record on all CPUs available. And we also want to collect call graphs, and then I'm just using the sleep command, then all events are, are collected currently running on your system. 
And as you can see with these numbers, this for five seconds, this is quite a high number of samples, so nearly one th uh, 100,000 samples for um, just five seconds. And as you can imagine, this there are quite a lot of samples if you call that um, if you call that longer. And with perf report, you can then display a profile about uh, a former uh, about a running um, record. And uh, okay, this is a little small here, but. This is uh, a report about a uh, collected record from a DD command, just copying one megabyte um, from dev0 to my block device. And I um, added some um, nice um, options to the perf report. I, want, I said, okay, I want to show the CPU utilization my program spent um, in, in syscalls and in kernel functions. And this was an encrypted file system, so okay. Some time was uh, spent in encrypting the, the actual data. Okay, this is EcryptFS, so the, the default um, encrypted file system used by Ubuntu. And then we can see, okay, also some time has been spent in the, in the actual write of DD. So this is nice if you, if you want to know where did my program spend its CPU time in which, in which function. This is just um, a quick hack to, to check what your application is doing. Brandon Gregg has also written some nice tools to show what is possible with, with F-Trace and the perf events. Um, some good examples are IO Snoop, which shows the IO access for your block devices, including its latency, so you can check what latency the, the command is um, producing. You can check with cache that how well your Linux page cache is used, and I want to show you that these are really um, simple bash scripts. Okay. So we are checking, this is other perf tools. And all what is done here is that we, ha we collect um, events about these four these four um, kernel counters. So we are measuring the cache access, we are measuring the cache writes, and we are measuring some page statistics. And with these four um, functions, we can um, do some calculation and say, okay, the page cache is used that well on my system. And these are not, so this bash script is not very long. You see that, that's all. And if we call cache that here, then it says, okay, we have um, that amount of hits with that amount of misses, that amount of dirty pages in my page cache, and buffers and the cache um, usage we have learned before with um, pitstat and mp uh, and freemstat. So these are nice examples what can be done with the perf tools. We've done now nearly twenty tools, so. Let's go on to the, to the final few tools. Um, who knows what a, a flame graph is? Who can explain a flame graph? Okay, that's one person. Just sh a short, some words about a flame graph. Um, yes? I've seen them. Ah, you've seen them, okay. So this is a, a, nice, um, a nice graphic about flame graphs. These are flame graphs for my dad. This is my working day. I'm processing some emails and I'm doing some bug fixing and the, from, um, the, the upper layers are always um, call traces, so this is actually a, a backtrace of the, of the commands issued. And at the top, at the top um, level is where the CPU time is spent. So at this level, the actual CPU time is spent. The colors um, are chosen by random, and the, the width of the boxes are the, the samples collected. So the longer the boxes, the more samples from this function ha have been collected. And yes, so the actual work we do is bug fixing, verifying issues, and cooking and testing a lot. <laughs> and as we have heard before, with perf record, we can also record um, the call graphs. So we add the minus g option here for our dd command. Then we take that record as input for perf script. Perf script can format and output the, a perf record. And we can that um, pipe to the flame graph. Uh, we do a flame graph script, also done by Brandon, and collapse it in the first step. In the next step, we can produce an, an, an picture, an SVG picture, 
which is also interactive. So if you roll over your mouse over your function, then you can see some more information and you can also dive in. Um, you just have to open the file with Firefox and then you can do that interactively. So this is a nice flame graph about our DD command. And again, we see that we have used an encrypted file system, so we have done some encryption here. So there's real um, CPU usage for um, file system encryption. And then we also have the, um, the real data access from our DD command. So this is just a simple command. And as you can see here in this simple example, this can, be, this can become quite complicated if you have more samples and if you have um, a lot of work doing on your CPU. But with these flame graphs, you can see, okay, if you have a lot of peaks up and a lot of, if the, the call traces are getting uh, more and more, then you can um, just get a nice view of where your CPU time is spent. Um, I'm stating here, like C is some special topic because uh, we will leave now the, the environment of traditional command line interface tools and go over to Lexi and my SQL counters. Um, who is using Lexi in here? Okay. Oh, that's quite surprising, not more people. Um, who's using Docker? Okay, not, not more. <laughs> and Lexi containers are using two features provided by a uh, Linux kernel, not only these two, but um, most of these two. The first one are cgroups, cgroups partition tasks and create a hierarchical um, group of isolated resources. So cgroups um, group things together and namespaces, namespaces create um, a few two processes that they think, okay, they have an isolated um, resource. So, if a process in a namespace, then he can think, okay, I have an isolated resource, but um, in reality, he's sharing that resource with, with other processes in other namespaces. And each container shares um, the same kernel running on the host, and some like about like see the native performance because um, there's no real hypervisor between the, the hardware and the actual running virtual machines. Virtual machines is, is maybe not the, the right term here because it's Yes, it's somehow some lightweight virtual machine. And with cgroups, you can divide your system into several subsystems. You can define CPU sets, which let you divide your CPU time in multiple parts. So you can say, okay, my SQL like C container can use 40% of CPU sets. So you can divide your CPU resource. Um, you can also do that with um, the blocker IOC group. So you can say, okay, my Lexi container A can only use um, 100 of megabyte for um, concerning the bandwidth for block device A. And you can also specify um, CPU core pinning. You can say, okay, my SQL container one can only use um, CPU core ones to, to four. That's nice um, with C groups. And there are also some um, C groups subsystems for memory and some more. You can check that in the kernel documentation. Um, we have one running um, Linux container here. Um, it's, its name is Ubuntu One. And if you check its counters with the Lexi info command, you can see okay, there are um, numbers about the CPU usage, number about the blocker usage, and numbers about the memory usage. Um, the container is actually using 30 bytes of memory. That's quite a small footprint, and it has not used the CPU very much. But um, I have, uh, I wanted to know where do these numbers come from, and I've prepared a small table about that. So the CPU usage is actually coming from the CPU account um, C group. This is the usage parameter in the CPU account C group. This is uh, CPU usage. The block um, IO usage has its origin in the block IO C group. So there's a sub parameter called throttled IO service bytes. The memory usage is the memory usage in bytes. That's the memory C group. Yeah, that's not very surprising. And you can also check the um, kernel memory used by the container. And the link statistics, this is, sorry, this is the last one. These are the link statistics. They come from the SUSFS interface. So this is not from a C group, but from the SUSFS interface. 
And there's even more. The C groups um, are providing, you can check uh, memory stat. These are detailed information, like we get them from the Brock VM stat um, file. The memory fail count is also interesting. This is the number of times the container has hit its memory limit. So if you specify one gigabyte memory limit and the container hits that limit, then memory fail count um, is increased. And you can also check the CPUs the container is using. That's um, just, uh, just a note. That's a nice value to check uh, with um, Nagios or Asinga because then you know that your container is consuming too much memory and you have to increase that memory. You have to, to watch um, fail count. There uh, is also a top command for Lexi, and that is called Lexi top. And with that, you can get an overview about the current running containers in your system. You can check the CPU, the blocker, and the memory usage. And just uh, one note at the end about Lexi, traditional tools without LexiFS um, do not work. Does anyone know why not? Also, when you call free in a container, is that really the memory usage the container has actually? Or does anyone know that? Who's using the containers? Who's using LXC? You raise your hand again, okay. So if you call free in a container, you, I don't know, <laughs> okay. So if you call free inside a container, inside LXC, then you don't get the, the correct numbers. I've specified a memory limit of um, 30 megabytes here for the container called Ubuntu One. And if we call free inside the container, so this is inside the container, then it reports free reports, okay, there are 287 um, megabytes free. But that's not correct. But as you've seen before, I've specified um, actually 30 megabytes. So um, this is because um, the Brock file system from the host is not correctly mapped into the container itself. So we need uh, some kind of bind mounting the Brock file system inside the container. And this is currently done by LexCFS. So LexCFS um, ensures that the Brock file system has the correct numbers inside the container. If you have LexCFS installed and mounted then, and you call free inside the container, then you get the correct numbers. So. Just um, keep that in mind that you need like CFS for calling traditional tools inside the container. Um, the last section is about my SQL. These are just um, two slides, I think. Um, so if you deal with my SQL, you do not come around the Percona tools and some Percona uh, monitoring plugins. Um, Percona provides a lot of useful information and lots of good tools concerning my SQL. And if you have a running MySQL server, in the first step you want to generate a short summary, you can use PT MySQL summary. Then you get, some, you get a very long list of detailed information. Um, what is interesting here is maybe the currently running MySQL socket. So what secret are you using? What socket are you using? And um, you can also check um, the currently running user and the time the server is running and the hostname and the databases you have, so this, there are 15 databases at this host. And if you want some extended status for the MySQL server, um, you can get that with the MySQL admin command and requiring the extended status. And as I've highlighted here with the word count, if I'm counting the lines here, you can see that I have more than 300 counters here available. And the good thing is that these counters can be monitored with the PMP check MySQL status plugin. So I really recommend to take a look at these counters and if there are several counters you want to, to monitor, then just install this plugin and say, okay, I want to, to monitor this and this counter from the MySQL um, admin command. The slow query log is also quite common. Um, the slow query log is um, logging MySQL commands exceeding a specific runtime. So if you specify, okay, five seconds for um, the slow query log, every query hitting this limit um, gets locked in the log file. It is off by default and it um, ignores the query cache. But it is also an easy way to log all the queries currently running on your MySQL server because if you specify zero for the long query time, that all queries um, gets locked in the query 
And then you can generate a nice re report with the pt query digest command. And this command processes the slow log and produces uh, a detailed report about your slow query log and also prints a lot of statistics about your queries run um, at your My MySQL server. And um, the statements are per default sorted by response time. And there's also one interesting indicator about your MySQL statements. This is the variation to mean parameter. Um, and this is the, the deviation to the, the mean time. Um, normally, um, statements um, need to take. So if this variation to mean parameter is very high, then it's a good indicator that you need to improve that statement. Um, last but not least, there's also a live analysis tool for statements currently running on your MySQL server, and this is called InnoTop. Um, it is not only for InnoDB, but mostly um, used for it. And if you call InnoTop, then you get a live view about the currently running statements at your MySQL server. That's really nice if you have some high CPU utilization for, from your MySQL server, and you want to check, okay, so what is currently running, um, which statements are currently running there. That's really um, a good um, point to start. So that's all. Um, and I'm looking forward to answer some questions now. I hope we are in time. Yes, that's good. So any questions? Okay. I must admit, uh, oh, I feel sorry about. Uh, okay, so the question was um, if there is any nice tool to to measure fiber channel performance, or uh, but I'm sorry, I must admit that I did not get in touch with fiber channel yet. So. Um, Okay. I did not find the bottom of it. The bottom. Does anyone has any experience with fiber channel performance measuring in here? Not yet. So maybe we can get into detail that later on. Maybe I'm, I'm sorry. Yes, okay. Not the question, but an addendum for the MySQL tools that you have been mentioning. Yes, you very nice. Okay. Yes. Um, I've provided a slide about that, but. Um, yeah, and you have this one step in Type 7, it will be done by part of the standard distribution. Um, and that is also making very many other performance yes. optimized velocity. It's uh, a short, far more detailed view about uh, what the server is doing and what's happening. Thanks for adding that. Yes. That's very nice. That's true. The performance um, scheme is um, default on um, with um, 5.6, and the older um, used profiling commands also become deprecated with that version. So MySQL is really pushing forward to use the performance scheme. And it is, um, as you've said, is a structured way also in SQL that you query tables about um, performance events running um, performance events um, recorded in your MySQL server. So I think there are more than 50 tables in the performance scheme. Very many. Very many. The uh, raw implementation is very hard to use. Yes. And the system has uh, a good few views that make it much more usable. Yes. Um, can Ah, oh, that's nice. And the views are only taking um, power for um, evaluating the data, not for collecting. So if they're not reading the tables, they cost you nothing. Uh, I've read a lot about the PS helper, but I must admit that I've not used it um, in productive environment. But um, the tables and the views created by PS Helper looked um, very promising. Yeah. So there are just one table from the PS Helper. You have um, schema table statistics, and you get um, events like rows fetched about uh, a specific table. So this is really nice, really yeah. nice statistics about. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, we have upgraded to 5.6 about two weeks ago, but um, we have currently turned off the performance team because we had um, not time to, to take a closer look at it, but we will do that, I think, in the, the next few months. Thanks about adding that. Another question? Okay, um, as, as far as, as I have it in mind, you can, um, there's, um, okay, sorry, um, just um, do it again. So the question is about um, monitoring and, and profiling, um, routing, routing and, uh, and bridging and so stuff um, in, in the kernel. I think there are events uh, from F-Trace. You can, you can check um, which, which functions concerning the, the network um, the network stack in the in the kernel? There are, I think there are some trace points you can do that with ftrace, as far as I have, I have that in mind. Okay, more? There's one more. Socket buffer overrun, are you you talking about that um, yeah. parameter? Dropping okay. Um, so thanks for noting that. I will take a closer look at that and maybe include that in my in my slides. Thanks. So um, no more questions. Uh, then thanks for your attention. And just one note: we have um, a award called this year the Thomas Grant Award. So if you participate in any open source project, then you can come to our booth and talk with um, my colleagues there about the Thomas Grant Award. You can um, win some, I think you can win some money there to buy um, Thomas Grant Server if you have an open source project that is interesting. There's, I think also Bernd is again in the, in the, in the jury this year again. So if you participate in an open source project, then come to our booth and get more information about the Thomas Grant Award this year. So thanks for your attention and maybe see you later again.